Um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for being here. Uh, Dr. Marshall, that was a super interesting talk. I'm so glad I managed to see that. Um, if I was there in person, I would ask you a hundred questions, um, maybe some other time. Uh, my name is Eric Lundgren. I'm a PhD student, or not anymore. I guess I'm, I'm a postdoc um, at Aarhus University in Denmark. And I've spent probably the last 10 years studying wild donkeys. Um, and, you know, Eric Davis asked me to speak about their adaptations to living in the wild and the harsh conditions they live in, which is I'm not exactly qualified for, but um, at least they're, you know, how they affect the environment and how they are in turn affected. But I'm afraid that I'm gonna be very rambly to get there and share to you why I find donkeys to be such an interesting animal to study in the wild. Um, and that starts with looking at Earth's history. So for about 35 million years, the world looked very different than it does today. Um, and some of you, of course, if you've seen me talk before at, at the don previous donkey office symp symposiums, I'm sorry for the redundancy. But I think it is really important in how we think about the, the arc of Earth, of the Earth, of our planet. Um, this is what England might have looked like about 115,000 years ago during the last interglacial. So climate similar to today, there were these short tusked elephants and water buffalo and hippos and hyenas. All these animals were in England of all places um, in today's climate. And North America itself had many equids, I think three to five equid species at least two of which were quite morphologically similar to wild donkeys, um, as well as ground sloths and mastodons, mammoths and such. And Australia itself, the weird island continent also had its suite of very bizarre large animals. This back here is a, um, in the far left corner is a flightless goose, 400 kilogram flightless goose. So about the size of a cow, which is troubling to say the least. Um, and, you know, this marks a really interesting thing that happens in Earth's history. As we know that when there were dinosaurs around, the planet was full of these huge animals, right? Just gigantic things. And then they go extinct around 66 million years ago. Um, and the survivors, um, particularly mammals, but also some birds, began to increase in body mass steadily following these extinctions. So this right here shows global maximum body mass over the millions of years after these extinctions and then global mean body mass. And this kind of plateaued out around 35 million years ago. And this is when you start to see equids in the fossil record, along with other things we'd recognize. Um, the entirety of current history uh, of the Holocene, the last 12,000 years is a little bit narrower than this vertical bar on the far right. Um, many times when people you know, show these geologic era maps, they change the scale so you can see the Holocene because we you know, feel pretty self-important about the Holocene. It's you know, when the climate was similar to today, it's when all of our known history happened um, most, but it's actually very small. It's just, you know, it's basically the zero. Most modern genera of species show up around 15 million years ago and most modern species show up around two and a half million years ago. And this is North America. So this is North American maximum body mass. Um, and North American mean body mass 10,000 years ago. And then something dramatic happens. Um, these body masses just completely collapse. Um, the majority of big animals in North America go extinct. And this happens everywhere in the world except for Africa and parts of Asia. So North American native maximum body mass today is right about where mean body mass was 10,000 years ago. And North American mean average body mass is about what it was 63 million years ago, right after the dinosaurs went extinct, which is quite profound, right? And I think it, it's important for understanding and how, how we think about the effects of animals like wild donkeys. Um, big animals, you know, they suffer these huge losses that correspond really strongly to when humans left Africa. Um, and you can see here, this is the world's remaining large animals. They're mostly in Africa. Um, and Southeast Asia to a small extent. This is animals over hundred kilograms, such as wild donkeys. Um, Australia has none. North and South America have one or two or three total uh, in a place, which is you know, pretty dramatic. This is the data that conservation biologists use. This is the IUCN data, the data that we use to make decisions, to plot assessments, to plot trend lines, to make headlines like um, reporting the status of biodiversity on our planet. But there's something strange about this. Um, 
you know, these animals, these animals that are mapped here, the majority of them are threatened, but these maps are not actually accurate. And that's because they're excluding um, a number of organisms, a number of megafauna species. And if you actually plot those, these are introduced wild megafauna, wild big animals over 100 kilogram kilograms. Suddenly Australia becomes nearly as species rich as Asia, as do parts of the Southwestern United States and Southern South America. Um, and this is due to introductions. So um, introductions of organisms. Uh, many of these, in the case of megafauna, are actually extinct or endangered in their native ranges. As you all know, and as Fiona mentioned, the African wild ass is critically endangered in its native range here, and yet has found refuge through donkeys in Australia, Southern South America, and North America, as well as parts of Europe. Um, and yes, these animals are diverse. There's water buffalo, there's hippos. I should have put a donkey on here. The world's only population of dromedary camels is in Central Australia, and they roam some, um, nearly the entire continent. It's quite remarkable how big their home ranges are. Um, this is this process that we could, um, a biotic redistribution. And I'm not sure if my Zoom controls are covering the slide. Um, one second. Aha, that's better. I can see my own slides now. Um, you know, we've connected the earth across our travel and trade routes. Um, I am, you grew up in Rochester, New York, spent time many years in Arizona, and now I'm in Denmark. And just like that, we've moved organisms around the planet, sort of creating a, what you could call an anthropangea, reconnecting the continents. And this is something that troubles a lot of conservation biologists because introduced organisms cause changes. Um, they can change the place that they're in. Um, we've all seen that with wild donkeys and with, you know, introduced plants. Um, oops, don't need to do that slide yet. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that if we reconsider these organisms in the context of Earth's history, we find results we wouldn't necessarily count upon. So this is work I did in 2020 that I'm gonna skip through really quickly to talk about some new work where we looked at these introduced organisms, introduced organisms like wild donkeys, wild horses, wild hippos in their introduced continents. And we looked at how these animals influence functional diversity. So the, the, um, the traits that are present in these systems to influence ecosystems. And so there, here's two figures of this. Um, you can ignore the figure on the left. Maybe it's pretty, but it's kind of mathematical to, to explain. The one on the top here is showing functional richness. So the diversity of traits in a system um, relative to the late Pleistocene. So when things, before things went extinct 12 to 40,000 years ago as humans left Africa. Um, the blue are if we only look at native continental assemblages of animals. And the gray are when we include animals like wild donkeys, which are otherwise not considered biodiversity. These animals are thought of as invisible in our assessments of, of life history, um, of biodiversity trends. And you can see that the blue points are all significantly lower than this dotted line, this dashed line of where the late Pleistocene was. And that the gray points increase this dramatically um, in some places, especially in Australia, as well as South America, where introduced animals are actually restoring Lost, trait, lost traits, lost diversity of traits in these systems. And this bottom panel here shows that um, introduced organisms actually make the world more similar to the late Pleistocene, to the past, to this time period before these extinctions. The blue again are if we only look at native biodiversity and the gray are if we include introduced species. And the taller the bar is, the more dissimilar um, you are from the late Pleistocene. So in pretty much all the continents where extinctions were severe, um, in all of them, I should say, introduced species actually make the world more similar to the past than native um, only communities are, which is quite dramatic. Um, and now I wanna talk about some new work to bring me back to talking about um, my field work with wild donkeys. And that's, you know, this, this, you know, we published this paper on functional diversity change that these animals like wild donkeys are actually very similar to things that were once in these continents. But surely the effects of introduced herbivores like donkeys are distinct from native herbivores because there is a whole field of a scientific discipline dedicated to documenting the effects of introduced species, um, the field of invasion biology. Um, and so we wanted to dig into this deeper. And this is work I've been working on um, during my postdoc um, based on this question. Could we tell 
if a species is introduced or native based on their actual effects. So in other words, um, a scene like here with these wild horses, um, you've seen pictures of this used to justify the eradication or removal of wild horses. Um, and the same with these feral camels here in Australia. But scenes like that play out in Africa too, where these animals are native. Zebras also trample wetlands. Um, they don't fly. I mean, they still walk. So do elephants. Um, so would an, an a ecologist who didn't know, who didn't know the system, didn't know the history of it, be able to measure and tell which species was native or not? Or in other words, is there a biological reality to nativeness? Because nativeness is this cornerstone idea that underlies the way we look at the world, the way we think about ecosystems working, and the way we make decisions about, for instance, removing wild donkeys um, from their feral ranges um, in North America or Australia and elsewhere. So to do this, I conducted a meta-analysis, and I'm sure some of you there are well, very familiar with meta-analyses, and I'd love to hear your, your um, analytical inputs on this. This was a comparison of exposure plots and control plots. Um, these points are indicating study locations. So these are areas where, where people put up a fence to look at the effect of something like feral donkeys or of elephants or, or of camels or of kangaroos or of white-tailed deer, for instance. Um, and people measure things like plant diversity responses and plant abundance responses. So how do donkeys affect soil, um, soil processes or plant cover or plant diversity? And you can take the data from these studies and you can calculate what's called an effect size and don't get scared by the math. Um, basically, if you have a plot where horses or donkeys have access versus a plot where they do not, you can take the difference in whatever you measure for instance, plant diversity between these two plots. And you can standardize it, um, in this case, by the standard deviation and the sample size. And that can produce this measure, which we call effect sizes, which are very important statistically because they actually tell you how strong something is. They're much more important than a p-value. Um, and these are gonna show you how these animals influence these various processes. And so for this project, we predicted that introduced megafauna would have a more negative effect on native plants than native megafauna because native plants had co-evolved with native megafauna, but not with introduced megafauna. And I hope that makes sense. Um, and we expected that effect to be most pronounced on oceanic islands, um, places that lack evolutionary history with megafauna. Um, and we also predicted that megafauna that are very different in these places they've been introduced are gonna have the most negative effects on uh, native biodiversity, native plant diversity. Um, and we measured that by looking at the functional and phylogenetic novelty of introduced megafauna. Um, functional by, in terms of their traits. So, and I'll explain this a little bit more later. We also expected that introduced megafauna would increase the abundance of introduced plants, particularly plants that they had co-evolved with. And these are predictions that are all common in the literature. These are the predictions, the claims that people make to justify how we respond to animals like wild donkeys. And here's some results. Um, I kind of meant to lead up to this with a dramatic pause, but here we are. So let me explain this first. This is the y-axis is effect on native plant diversity. Positive values mean that the herbivore, the megafauna increases native plant diversity. Negative values mean the herbivore reduce plant diversity and zero mean they have no effect. There was no difference between the exclosure plot and the grazed plot. Um, each point is a data point from a study. Um, so there were 11 studies of introduced megafauna on continents and 68 data points, 504 data points from 58 studies of native megafauna on continents. And the same you can see here, the sample sizes are beneath. And what's remarkable here is that there is no difference in impact on native plant diversity between native megafauna and introduced megafauna, um, which is quite remarkable, I'd say, because this distinction of nativeness is paradigmatic to conservation policy um, and to millions of dollars spent on controlling introduced organisms, um, including animals like wild donkeys. Here is um, for equids. So here are studies that included native equids, Unfortunately, most of those also included 
you know, very complex, diverse communities of animals, like with elephants and rhinos and, you know, 15 species of antelope. And here are feral equids. So wild horses and wild donkeys, um, feral horses and feral donkeys. And again, no difference in impact between these organisms. Um, and ignore that X axis label right there. I just made this figure right before uh, 10 minutes ago and I forgot to update that. Um, but this is starting to answer that question of whether you'd be able to tell a difference between these two organisms. But you know, there's, there's a couple other things that could be going on. Maybe the introduced megafauna are influencing some systems but not others because of you know, horses, the animals, the plants in North America co-evolved with horse-like animals for millions of years. So perhaps that explains things. Um, but if you take that into account, you actually don't see any difference either. So on the left are continental biomes, so plant communities, like imagine the, um, the plant communities just outside of Sacramento. Um, did they co-evolve? Did they have history, evolutionary history with the introduced or native megafauna? You can see all the native megafauna impacts, the, the brown points are in this co-evolved category, and here are novel interactions. So where they did not share any co-evolutionary history. And again, no difference in the impact of herbivores on native plant diversity, which is quite striking. And here is looking at what are called the worst invasive species, the 100 worst invaders, of which there are three large animals, um, wild boar, uh, red deer, and goats. And there's no difference between them and other introduced megafauna, which is quite strange, because this is another um, very important and paradigmatic idea, uh, this list of the hundred worst. These are animals that are prioritized for eradication and a lot of money is spent killing them. But maybe the effects of these introduced herbivores vary with their phylogenetic or functional novelty. Functional novelty means the, the difference in terms of their traits. Um, and phylogenetic novelty means how related they are or not. So for instance, studies that happened in Nevada on the impacts of feral horses or in Arizona on the impacts of wild donkeys, um, there were very similar equids in those regions uh, 12,000 years ago. And we looked at the map of, of the world prior to these extinctions to calculate these novelty scores. So introduced donkeys or horses would be very similar to the animals that were present before. Whereas in Australia, introduced water buffalo are very unrelated to the giant weird marsupials that were there 40,000 years ago. And the same thing with functional novelty, except we're looking at traits. So how similar they are in terms of traits, not necessarily in terms of um, taxonomic evolutionary relationships. And so that's what us on the x-axis here. Here's phylogenetic novelty, here's functional novelty, and here's the effect on native plant diversity. And again, no relationship. Finally, uh, many invasion biologists have claimed that introduced megafauna facilitate something, a process they call invasional meltdown. Um, because these animals haven't evolved in these systems, they facilitate int other introduced organisms, other introduced plants, and in doing so, um, drive this radical change of ecosystems to something we wouldn't recognize. And we don't really see much evidence for that. We see a little evidence in this data set. So here are responses of native plants to native megafauna and introduced megafauna on continents and offshore islands, and the responses of introduced plants to native megafauna and introduced megafauna, again, on continents and offshore islands. And you can see that introduced megafauna do facilitate introduced plants a little bit more than native megafauna. But this difference is not significant. And it, I think it's driven by reporting bias because there are only three studies that actually report introduced plant abundance responses to introduced megafauna on continents. And what's more supportive of our skepticism about this, uh, about this process of invasional meltdown is that when you go to oceanic islands, there is no difference in the impact of introduced megafauna on native plants or introduced plants on these islands that have never co-evolved with megafauna in their history. And again, here we have the evolutionary history, the co-evolutionary history of native uh, of plants with or plant species at species level with megafauna species. And again, no difference based on co-evolutionary history. These are ideas that are um, so baked into conservation biology and ecology that it's really quite striking that there is no sign of them, no signal. Um, 
and I'll skip this because I, I feel like I'm going a little too long on this section. The final question we've asked, um, and I'm very happy about this because I this figure, I made this figure about an hour ago. <laughs> this meta analysis, meta analyses take a lot of time, um, a lot of time to go through that data. It was about 500 studies we digitized. I digitized. I should. I'm not going to share that credit with anyone else because it was just me. Um, and it's very hard to interpret because the data is very messy. As you can see, there's a lot of variance. So one way we looked at this was, does this idea of nativeness provide any information value? Does it provide any insight, even if it's not significant? Is it provide us some kind of indication of something that's real? And one way to do this is to look at how it changes model quality. So, you know, when we do statistics, we're building a model to explain to explain the relation to the observed data. Um, and we can compare the fit of those models, the quality of those models by calculating things like uh, Bayesian information criteria. So how much information is that model explaining? Um, penalized for how many factors you're including. And here on the y-axis, we have various variables that could explain the impacts of megafauna. Um, things that we've talked about before here, continents versus islands, um, th environmental variables, trait variables um, and things like the predators present. Um, and each of these points is that factor and the blue is with that factor without nativeness and the pink is that factor with nativeness. The dashed line is an intercept only model. So basically just the average, no statistics explaining what we're finding in these results, what's shaping the effects of herbivores. And if this is all confusing you right now, I apologize. But the main point is that in all cases, including nativeness, this cornerstone variable, this cornerstone idea actually reduces model quality in explaining native plant diversity and, and plant abundance. The things that do improve our understanding of these impacts is actually traits. So the traits of these animals and the traits in particular that matter is a weird trait. Um, it's muzzle width, um, and this is plotted here. So maximum muzzle width is a, is a proxy for how specialized or generalist animals are. Animals like deer are over here on the left. Um, these animals tend to have a more negative effect on plant diversity at the scales people measure um, these impacts, at least. We have to remember that this is all scale dependent. And that's because they are selective feeders. They have a, a rumen, they need to eat high nutrient, high quality vegetation. Um, and if they don't, they will starve. They can't eat dry biomass like a donkey can. Animals like rhinos and equids, um, these bigger animals, water buffalo, can eat more fibrous nutrients are less picky. They can eat more things. And in doing so, they actually seem to increase plant diversity, which corresponds to a great deal of grazing theory. So now to talk a little bit more about donkeys themselves, this is, I mean, I guess this is how I think about my research, particularly in the field, is what happens if we look at these animals, which most people in my profession consider pests, and we just study them as wildlife. Um, there's a lot of notions that hold us back from doing this, but a lot of those notions actually are difficult to trace in the literature to anything real, as I just showed you with um, these lack of differences uh, between native and introduced megafauna. And it turns out when we study them as wildlife, we actually find some really interesting things. So here's some wild donkeys. These animals, and I'm, you may, all may have heard um, about this, um, especially if you've seen me talk before, but they dig wells to groundwater. This is an adaptation that allows these animals to live in extremely harsh environments, um, as we all know, and as Fiona so wonderfully showed us, um, these animals will dig nearly five feet in depth. Um, that's a, the deepest that's been described in the literature, but I expect that during drought, they will dig much deeper. Um, this is in Arizona right now. Um, and these resources that they make, these wells, become used by a number of species. Um, nonetheless, thirsty field biologists, but also pretty much every other vertebrate you can imagine, uh, many invertebrates. Many of these wells would just be full of butterflies and wasps and bees. Um, quite an incredible thing. And this is um, work that I published, I guess, last year, um, looking at the contribution of these features to water availability. So here we have a, a figure of, of the contribution of equid wells 
to percent of total water availability in these desert streams. Um, and the x-axis is temperature. Um, and so on average, donkey wells are providing about 30%, 35% of the water in these systems. But especially when it gets hotter and at these systems that are intermittent, donkey wells are the only water present. So the only water within kilometers. And that, you know, also involves changing the, the spatial structure of the water and the landscape, which if you imagine you're living as an animal in a place and there's only one water source and it's stinky and there's lots of predators around, it's a very risky place to go. But when you have donkeys in the system, suddenly there's 15 small water sources around in the area in that same stream. Um, and so that's what these figures here show. This is the density of water features. So on the left is only looking at background water, any water that was present without donkeys digging for it. And here is with equid wells. And you can see that there's a substantial increase in just the density of water features per kilometer. And here is the isolation of water features. So how far are you having to go to get to a water source? And this is in kilometers. Um, so if you're only looking at the water that was available otherwise, features are very different distance from each other, around one and a half, 1.3 kilometers away from each other. But with Equidwell, suddenly average distances are 100 meters or so. So they're making this, these desert environments much wetter. Um, and then animals are using these. Um, so this here is showing average richness, a number of species of vertebrates um, per trap night. Um, and you can see that background waters and Equidwell waters are being used much more than dry controls, places in these same streams where there is no water. Um, and the same goes for the duration of the events, for how long these deer and these bobcats and these jays and these javelina are present at these features. They're much more present for longer at other water sources and as at equid wells. Basically, equid wells are water. Even though they were dug by donkeys, animals are using them like they would any other water source. And this is the number of visits to these sites per day as temperatures increase. Um, so as temperatures increase, animals are going um, numerous times per day to these sites, as well as to other water sources. And what's very interesting about this is that this is a function, you could call it a function, which is something we talk about in ecology for the type of thing something does that affects other organisms. <laughs> it's kind of a, it's almost a problematic buzzword, but it's useful in parlance. Um, there are other species that dig wells, like coulons, which, um, Fiona and Eric were talking about earlier, Asian elephants, Grebe zebras, Hemsbach, um, African elephants, they dig wells, as do feral horses and feral donkeys. The red ranges here, the red polygons, are the, the remaining distribution of these native well diggers inside of drylands. So these beige polygons are the world's drylands and the world's projected drylands. And you can see that introduced megafauna, introduced feral horses and feral donkeys, have actually restored this capacity to maintain surface water across a huge portion of the world. Actually, a, a portion that's larger right now of drylands than what has um, native well digging animals. Australia right now has a, you know, a wonderful distribution of wild uh, equids that are digging wells in dry rivers in that system. Um, and here are some of the native well diggers. Um, in the native range, of course, of these animals, this is considered a keystone behavior, an ecosystem engineering behavior. Um, and I was lucky enough in South Africa a couple of weeks ago to see this myself. This is a well dug by a mountain zebra that was being used by hyena and baboon um, and a number of antelope species. It's very cool to see in the native range of an equid. Um, but, you know, and I'm talking about this right now as if, as if these animals, because there is this, you know, late Pleistocene prehistoric baseline of these animals being present, that these introduced animals are necessarily restoring ecosystems to some kind of perfect harmonious past state, which is a, a claim I do not want to make. I don't think ecosystems work that way. And I also want to be clear that um, the way organisms affect the environment is determined by context. Um, which is something we can forget about in ecology, especially when we talk about organisms that are inherently bad, like the invaders, the, um, the donkeys that built ships to come and conquer and rape and pillage. Those are metaphors that I don't think really help us understand them ecologically. And one thing that can really help us understand them is to quantify and pay attention to ecological context. And one of those contexts 
as you can see from this grizzly slide, and I apologize for the gore, um, is that we are very intolerant of predators. Predators that can hunt animals like wild donkeys or horses. Um, I thought it was a, you know, a rumor, but when you go to Australia um, and you drive out into the country, you'll start seeing trees like this with dingoes hung up, hundreds of dingoes shot or poisoned and hung up. Um, and in North America, we're a little better um, we like making pyramids of, of mountain lion heads, and we kill a lot of these predators for fun or just simple intolerance. Um, and this has an ecosystem consequences. Um, it also has consequences, I guess, the point being that we tend to ignore this when we do research on animals like wild donkeys and wild horses. So these are number of art, and this is the number of articles for certain types of questions from the peer reviewed literature about wild horses and wild donkeys. Um, the red bars or the dark red bars are studies that just completely ignore whether there are pres predators present in the systems with the animals they're studying. They just don't mention it. Or they explicitly deny that wild horses and wild donkeys have predators. And the blue are studies that actually studied or acknowledged the potential that predation might happen and might affect um, the influences of wild horses and wild donkeys. And you can see here that the, the studies on the ecological effects of wild horses and wild donkeys um, several studies explicitly deny that they could have predators, and the rest of them just completely ignore whether there were present predators in the system that they were studying, which I think is a pretty uh, grievous oversight. Um, but there is a, a legitimate question here, because donkeys and horses are much bigger than the native prey um, of mountain lions um, in the places where wild donkeys are. Um, lesser extent with horses, where you have maybe elk which are you know, not, not as big as a horse, but similar size. And so many people have, I think somewhat reasonably said or claimed that extant predators are unable to influence wild horses and wild donkeys. And that the predator that's most likely to be able to influence them are cougars or mountain lions, because these animals overlap and range with, with donkeys and horses. Um, even though gray wolves have made some degree of a comeback in the United States in the lower 48, um, they really do not overlap in any meaningful way with horses or donkeys. Um, horses or donkeys, when they were around uh, 12,000 years ago, they were interacting with these big things, American lions, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves. And just to explain this figure, the horizontal lines here are the prey range, the preferred prey range of the predator. And the red points are actual observed um, dietary items, uh, prey by body mass. So this x-axis is body mass and it goes through the entire plot. So what you can see from this is that cougars primarily eat small animals, things around the size of a deer, with a couple of records of them eating things around 120 kilograms. Whereas donkeys and horses are much larger than that, especially as adults, um, which justifies in some ways people thinking that cougars won't be able to influence donkeys and horses. Um, which is why it was so amazing recently to realize that this is not true. So this is work, I, I did present preliminary portion of this um, at a donkey welfare symposium a couple of years ago. I always feel bad because science is an extremely slow process. Um, so, you know, two years will go by, and I'll be circling on the same thing I presented here last time. And I hope uh, it's not too boring for, for you, those of you who were present before. So this is work I did in Death Valley, not too far from Sacramento. I mean, a good enough drive, but closer than Denmark. Um, these are wetlands in this region. This is a region with an abundant feral donkey population. This region is the southern, southern uh, Panamans. This is Butte Valley, if anyone is familiar. It's an absolutely gorgeous place. And these wetlands are marked with points. The gray points are sites where cougars, um, the gray, I guess I should say diamonds, are sites where cougars were absent. And these are, that's because these are at campsites. So there's campsites right here. I put up camera traps at all of these locations. Cougars never went near here because people are too close. These gray circular points are places where cougars were present here and there, um, but there was no evidence that they were hunting wild donkeys. Whereas the red points are areas where mountain lions were actively hunting wild donkeys. There were kills throughout these wetlands buried in the vegetation. And I can talk more about how I find them, found them and what they look like, um, but I'll first show you a sequence. And let me just um, warn you that if you're sensitive to this kind of thing, I apologize um, and um, there's gonna be about 30 seconds of looking at a sequence of a mountain lion attack on a wild donkey foal. Um, the wild donkey foal is right here to the right and its mother is right here 
It's about 4.47 in the morning. Um, and you can see something's happening here. The, the foal is moving to the left and then a mountain lion is striking it. And the mountain lion kills it within a couple minutes quite quickly and drags his body to be consumed. Um, and those slides are over if you were sensitive to that, I apologize. But this raises a question and this is a kind of a, you know, if we wanna think about how these animals adapt to living in the wild, how they respond, um, and what are the ecological consequences of those responses? What would you consider? Um, mountain lions are ambush predators. Um, and that female, that mother donkey made a strange decision to going to that wetland before sunrise. And we can see that here looking at the data. So this is one of the ways that animals can respond to predation, um, which has downstream consequences on ecosystems. So this figure here, and I'm sorry to be, you know, presenting so much data, so many figures. I hope these are clear enough. And I wish I could be in person to look at your faces to see if you're completely confused. Um, but I'm just going to have to guess and uh, go ahead. Um, the y-axis here, and I hope you can see my cursor as well, is showing the activity um, density in time. So how active the animals are. And the x-axis is showing time of day. So midnight, sunrise, noon, sunset, midnight. These are sites where cougars are absent, sites where cougars are present, but kills are absent. And you can see the donkeys where cougars are absent are active mostly at night, um, peaking kind of in the middle of the day and then active through the sunset, through midnight, only leaving around dawn, um, which is quite striking. And then you go to places where cougars are present, but kills are absent and the donkeys start to be a little less active at night. They're still there for about half the time, but they're more active in the middle of the day and more of them are leaving towards sunset. And then what's really striking is when you go to sites where kills are actually happening, where donkeys are actively hunting, um, cougars are actively hunting donkeys, uh, donkeys become almost entirely diurnal. Um, in fact, that previous sequence of slides, that was one of the only visits to that wetland um, before sunrise. And it had an immediate consequence on that foal um, because that mountain lion was able to capture it much more effectively than it would be able to do in the middle of the day. Um, this dashed line here is the activity pattern of cougars themselves. These animals are dependent on low light cover for ambushes, um, although this is not entirely true and not always true. Um, and they're definitely more active around sunrise, sunset, and middle of the night. But what's interesting about this ecologically and as an ecologist who thinks about how donkeys impact ecosystems is how this shapes the activity um, durations of wild donkeys. So here again is maximum daily temperature, which drives how much these animals need water. And this is the number of hours that donkeys were active at a wetland per day. Um, and as you can see, as temperatures increase, donkeys become more and more active, but they become less so at areas with kills. At areas without kills, they will be there for 13 hours a day on average when temperatures are over 35 Celsius. But at sites with kills, they'll only be there for, um, this depends on how you do the model. This model is showing around three hours, but if you take the actual average of the data, they're there on average for 40 minutes a day when temperatures are over 35 Celsius. And this has real consequences for how donkeys affect these ecosystems. So to look at that, um, to conclude this, this paper that I'm talking about, we, um, we sampled these wetlands. And you can see here on the top is a wetland that has been just trashed by wild donkeys. This is um, by the geologist cabin, cabin, Anvil Spring in the Butte, Butte Valley of Death Valley. This place has been you know, reduced to just a few, a couple plant species that are very nasty tasting. Uh, rabbit bush and this baccarat species that are extremely, these are asters that are just don't taste good. Um, donkeys will eat a little bit of it, but they don't like it. Everything else has been trampled. And here down here is a wetland. This is the wetland where that, that donkey was killed by a mountain lion, as I showed you. And this place is actually quite lush. Um, there's willows. Um, only half the wetland is actually accessed by donkeys. The other half is um, untrampled. And donkeys are only here for 40 minutes a day, even when it's extremely hot. So we sampled this at, at about 15 wetlands across Death Valley National Park in this region and measured the percent trampled bare ground, the percent of the perimeter of these wetlands that was vegetated, 
the amount of the water surface that was vegetated with the emergent vegetation, and the number of independent trails that are accessing the water. Um, and these are all impacts that people are concerned about when they talk about the effects of wild donkeys on ecosystems. And again, I hope this isn't too confusing. This is a ordination plot. So this is describing each of these points is a wetland on this figure on the right. They're, the closer they are together, the more similar they are to each other. And these arrows show you the, the dimensions of their similarity or dissimilarity. Um, so the points in gray on the left are sites where there were no kills and they had high trail density, high percent trampled bare ground, and also less woody cover, less water vegetated, um, less canopy cover and less herbaceous cover. Whereas sites with kills were significantly more vegetated and it's significantly fewer trails. And just, I think I have a couple more minutes. I don't have a timer going on my Zoom. Um, so I just, please just cut me off if I'm done. Um, this connects to what I am working on at the moment. Um, and I would love input from anyone who, there. There are ideas that, you know, that organisms coexist, as I mentioned before, because they've co-evolved with each other. Is, am I, is my time up? Yeah, what can, um, have you, oh, sorry, go back. Because this is actually just, yeah, I'm on like three sides. No, you but I can't see anything. It seems like my Zoom is uh, made come invisible. Let's see. You, you can just um, go on and um, to wrap up, don't need to escape everything. We'll just eat a little bit into the Q&A and people at the coffee break will um, ask you questions if that's okay. Yeah, um, that's fine. I mean, I'm actually fine not talking about that stuff. I thought I would be under time, so I put that in there, but I'm actually quite happy not talking about it. I can talk about it. Uh, you know, all I was going to say is that there are a lot of questions about how wild donkeys and wild horses could coexist with native animals, things like bighorn sheep and pronghorn, and whether coevolution matters for that. And that's some stuff I'm working on looking at sites in Africa and in uh, North America. And I'd be happy to talk to you guys about that um, in a different manner. but. I'm, I'm happy to wrap up right now. Yeah, we have a couple questions. Wonderful. Uh, uh, virtually, um, do wild horses also dig wells in the Southwest? They do, yeah, they dig wells in Arizona um, and I'm sure they do elsewhere. Most wild horses are in areas that are a little more mesic, a little more water already available. There was work in um, Australia, or at least some anecdotes in Australia of wild horses digging wells so deep that they disappeared into them. Um, they completely go underground getting that water. Cool. Uh, any question from the live audience? Yes. Do you have the microphone? No. Oh. It's a, a question from Eric to Eric. Ah, wonderful. Uh, so the other, um, I don't know, 800 pound megafauna herbivore, um, uh, certainly in the United States and to some extent Australia, are domestic cattle. And so when, when you're looking at these, um, effects on biodiversity or is that including domestic cattle um the meta analysis share that's a great question um it's not because if i were then i would never have finished data collection there's thousands of papers on the effects of domestic cattle um so we looked at only at wild animals and i do think that that really matters for how you know depends on what you're measuring but there's some key differences between how a, a feral cattle and a domestic cattle would affect environments. Um, and a lot of that has to do with fencing, but it also has to do with, you know, domestic cattle are usually in female only herds, which is a lot, reduces the incentive for them to move because there's no territoriality and there's no tension. Feral cattle in uh, Central Australia, they, the, the bulls fight each other constantly and chase the females and you actually, they're like ghosts in the landscape. They do not sit in the wetlands all day. They're quite mobile, um, and dynamic. And I, so I think that is a big difference, but um, we didn't include it in the meta-analysis and that would be very worthwhile doing, but it, I would, it would, that 
the data for that meta-analysis, I had to, you know, you digitize the individual figures from papers and the tables. It took me a year and a half. And so if I had included livestock, I would have, I would have died. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Eric. And if nobody's going to ask uh, another one, I'm going to, sorry. Um, so it's my understanding, uh, and you're the ecologist, so I, I could very well be wrong about this, but there are very, very few ranges all across North America that have entirely native plants on them. Is that, and, and so it seems it would be very difficult to make a determination of how a introduced species would affect native flora, because the flora isn't native to begin with. I mean, well, most, so that, that was tricky, but most studies do report, you know, diversity of native plants versus diversity of introduced plants or abundance of native plants versus abundance of introduced plants. So, that, you know, some studies don't, which, you know, many of the studies, so in those we, you know, we've analyzed without those and also including those as native because since they were unspecified and since most people really care about whether the plants are native or not, it, it's a pretty good um, assumption that they probably were uh, native or introduced plants or taking up only a minor component of it. But we've looked at both of those and there's no, um, there's no pattern that introduced megafauna have any different of an effect than native megafauna in terms of native versus introduced plant responses. Um, there is another uh, question, virtual attendant. Is any of the research reaching governmental bodies um, here in the states responsible for managing wild burrows? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I try to keep out of the politics side because um, it's, you know, I, 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 it has, and it's made it hard to get permits sometimes in the field. But you know, I try I try not to get too deep in the mud. Um, ultimately, the people that are managing these animals, you know, um, are doing their best job to understand these systems and to manage them responsibly. Um, and I have you know respect for them. But I do think we can push the science forward and the public conversation. And hopefully, the you know, hopefully we can look at the world and start thinking about. Um, maybe we should stop killing mountain lions in Nevada to see how that influences uh, wild horses and wild donkeys, as opposed to spending millions of dollars to round them up and put them in a holding. Um, and I hope that those, those alternative ways to look at this, which you know, also converge with public sentiment towards predator protection, um, I think may be effective. But yeah, I try to, I try to keep myself out of that, that level. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Has this research resulted in any pause or reflection in the culling of feral donkeys in the BLM? Well, the BLM, fortunately, is, you know, they, they, they don't call them lethally. Um, and no, I don't think it has, but I, I, I would hope that in some, it makes, give pause at times, um, you know, and, and it's not even my research that I think gives the strongest evidence for this. There was work done in, in Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge in the 90s where they removed all the wild donkeys. And shortly thereafter, the wetlands there went dry. Um, they filled in with cattails and reeds and these endemic fish went extinct. And this is you know, the only evidence of wild donkeys being involved in the extinction or endangerment of an animal in North America is of an endangerment and extinction following their removal. So it's like the evidence is completely on the opposite side of the narrative. And they're trying right now to remove wild donkeys from that entire region, from Death Valley and the surrounding HMAs. And I do fear that there's gonna be some really strong inadvertent consequences from that, um, that no one is going to like, but no one's gonna see because they're not uh, monitoring for it. So I do hope that that changes um, and we'll see if it does. Thank you, that's a great answer. So a question and sort of uh, reflecting back on something I think you talked about a couple of years ago, but looking at how the, the impact on water availability and, and, and that thing, and then talking about native versus introduced plants, it, it seems we talked a little bit about with climate change, the native plants are gonna move on. This is not a, it's not a static situation. 
And there are just as there are introduced African wild asses in North America and South America that are having a positive impact, which you also just touched on. Um, isn't that one of the challenges of trying to discern like a, a bad invasive that's displacing things versus an invasive or an inter introduced thing that's actually moving the ecology forward or supporting the ecology? And I'm sorry, it turned out to sort of not be a very good question, but also congratulations on the science article, because that seems to me like evidence of impact and starting to pay attention to the points that you've been making. Well, thank you so much. So is, are you, uh, um, what was your name? I can't see you. Well, depressing. Uh, well, Dibdal. Okay, so nice to meet. So nice to uh, meet you. I'm glad you saw me earlier. Um, I wish I was there. No, it's a great comment, and it's it's a complex complex question you raise. It's with no easy answer. I guess the thing that I come back to is, would we know what an impactful invasive species is if we didn't know it was? Um, I'm trying to think in the Sacramento region, and I can't quite picture, but there are many systems where the, there is a native dominant plant, maybe redwoods. You go to a redwood forest, it's redwoods, it's all redwoods. It's actually very low plant diversity. If you were to think that redwoods were introduced and you didn't experiment removing redwoods, you would see a huge increase in native plant diversity from the removal of redwoods. That's the same type of evidence we have about introduced plants. It's the same logic, except that it's absurd, right? It's absurd when we talk about redwoods as an invasive species, but functionally, is it any different? And that's a really unsettling question. Um, and if, I don't know if there's any ecologists in the audience, but they would be, I, I imagine most of them would be shaking their fists at me. But I think it's something we have to really wrestle with because we use these terms as if they're common sense, but they're actually not. So yes, I don't know. It's fascinating discussions. I wish I was there to have coffee and talk about them with you.